Hey friends, good morning. Today is 13th of December 2020. This has been an indifferent year, though it seems that a vaccine is around the corner. I, in my series of random thoughts out of my interest and long association with multi beam systems, basically for our print lot of young surveyors and survey tech, have been compiling a discussion on orientation in the incredible multi beam systems and the factors influencing its image compilation. Now I had been a part of Rezone 7125 training in Gravesend with Port Authority of London a couple of years back. This is just me sharing my information, training and experiences. Although this discussion is not all inclusive and does not have the scope to provide a definitive response, well it may yet shed light on some of the issues of our interest. Today our discussion would be around trans receivers, its making, the electronics, and the acoustics associated with it. Ceramics in steel or a titanium casing is mounted on a cork back material and then it is covered with polyurethane just to protect it from damage and prevent any water ingress. Now this is then filled with oil to match the water pressure or for impedance matching of the trans receiver. Now we are aware that ceramics oscillate to create isotropic waves. While we need a directional along track propagation for a multi beam system, a single sound energy source would spread spherically, which from the multi beam point of view is just a waste of energy. Hence, the multi beam system has a projector that comprises of multiple ring ceramic arrays that suppress the side lobes or it is for the side lobe rejection. Well, we are aware that transmitter at the sonar operating frequency generate voltage pulses. The piezoelectric ceramic projector responds to the applied voltage with oscillations, generating acoustic pings. The transmit beam has a pattern. It has a wide beam across the track and a narrow beam along the track, with maximum power going to the outer swath of the main globe. So, this is about the transmitter. Now let's come to the receiving part. The receiver array receives the acoustic echoes and reconstructs it. The process is just the inverse of the projector. It again uses multiple block ceramics. Each receiver channel is connected to its own electronic circuitry or channel. Now the point to note here is that the number of channels in a multi beam has no relation with the number of beams in a multi beam system. An individual ceramic or a channel is not equivalent to a beam, but it's the beam width that depends on the length of the array or the aperture and the operating frequency. Now the point to note here is that each of the channel is excited by the acoustic returns from all the directions. So each channel uses the RMS value of the signal to determine the part of the signal of its own interest. The elements of an array are spaced half a wavelength apart. The more the elements or the channels used in an array, the narrower the beam width. So the relationship we can just make here is that along with that operating frequency, the number of channels determine the beam width while the number of beams determine the swath width of a system. There would be typically 150 to 256 channels in a multi beam receiver, which may be curved or flat. Now this basically depends whether the system is to be used for beam steering or not. To put it in perspective, for beam steering, the receiver beam forming creates a virtual subarray by adding time delays to it. Now to apply the correct time delays for a given steering angle, the local sound velocity must be precise. Just to distinguish between the two, the flat array receiver provides good side lobe suppression, but the beams get broader with the steering angles. Beam forming itself in it is a complex process and it is more susceptible to sound velocity errors in beam steering, while in the curved array, it provides same beam width at all the steering directions and it is more tolerant to the changes in sound velocity when steering the beam, but on the downside, it is rather inefficient to suppress the side load. Looking at it from the user's perspective, in shallow water near shore or river surveys, it is prudent to employ the curved receiver array. While surveying in deep waters, a flat receiver is just fine. Now, before we conclude our discussion, a bit on the receiver channel data. Simply stating, 
Minute voltages are generated proportional to the incoming sound pressure level on the receiver ceramics. There are two transformations thereafter which happen. One is the digitization of signal and the other is the application of the gain which basically is the amplification of the signal. So these voltages are amplified and then converted to digital signals by the analog to digital converter or the ADC card. The voltage generated for each channel is then digitized. The digital signal characteristics are defined by the ADC resolution and also the sample rate as we had discussed in our earlier discussion. The sample rate could be like a 8-bit or a 12-bit quadrature sampling. At the receiver stage, a time varied gain or a TVG is applied. TVG basically is the gain level that increases over the time during the receive cycle. When we transmit an acoustic pulse, the first returns are generally those from the closest surface which usually are the nadir beams. These are much stronger generating much higher voltage amplitude than those arriving later in the receive cycle. The late arriving returns are the most affected by absorption and spreading loss. The TVG normalizes the signal amplitude with respect to the spreading and absorption losses. Absorption is the amount of energy absorbed by the water which includes the backscatter and the attenuation. It varies with frequency, salinity and temperature. Spreading loss is due to the energy dissipation as the wave front increases with the range. To give it a perspective, in fresh clean water or in water with a sea floor that is a very good reflector, the absorption and spreading losses are typically low than in the salt water or the water where the sea floor is a poor reflector. The TVG setting for absorption and spreading affect the shape of the TVG curve. The output is tuned to the operating frequency of the sonar system. The next stage to it is the fixed gain amplifier using two operational amplifiers which feed the bandpass filter. So here we conclude our today's discussion. In our forthcoming discussions, we may well discuss sonar processors which among other things receive and demultiplexes digitized channel data from the receiver and beamforms the channel data. We can discuss the beamforming board which basically is the heart of the sonar and is also called an alpha data card. The link module which handles the communication and also passes on 48 volt DC to the wet end or the trans receiver. The link controller, the transmitting module and its charge circuit which basically is the energy reservoir of the system. Now what happens? There is a 48 volt input to the transmitter module but its output is a variable voltage determined by the desired transmitting pulse amplitude which may vary from 0 volts to approximately 96 volts. I hope today's discussion was interesting and a bit informative. Catch you up later. Take care. Mm -hmm.